When one thinks of the motor system of the, of the brain, it's usually reduced to the motor strip in the cerebral hemisphere, its connections, or its connection through the cortical spinal tract, with the anterior horn cell, or the lower motor neuron, and then the lower motor neuron and its axon to the muscle. Now, these are very important players in this drama, but they're not the only important elements that we need to be aware of and understand in interpreting the motor findings in the motor examination um, on the neurological exam. First, we need to add two control circuits that influence the cortical spinal tract. Those control circuits are the basal ganglia and the cerebellum. There are also the indirect brainstem motor control centers and their pathways, which tonically activate lower motor neurons, especially those that innervate axial and anti-gravity muscles. The cortical spinal tract has its main influence on the motor neurons that innervate the muscles of the distal extremities, the hand and the foot. The cortical spinal tract also, and this is a key point, has collaterals that modulate and control the indirect brainstem motor centers so that we are not a stiff statue opposing gravity, but rather we can move at will and have just the right amount of supporting tone. So when there is a lesion of the upper motor neuron, the upper motor neuron is the cortical spinal tract and its collaterals to the brainstem motor nuclei. The clinical findings are a combination of the loss of direct effect of the cortical spinal tract on the lower motor neuron, plus the loss of control and modulation of the indirect brainstem motor control centers. The clinical findings from an upper motor neuron lesion will include loss of distal extremity strength, dexterity, and a Babinski sign. These are all from a loss of the direct cortical spinal tract effect. Plus, we have the findings of increased tone, hyperreflexia, and the clasp knife phenomenon, which are from loss of control over the indirect brain stem centers. Lesions of the lower motor neuron, the final common pathway, result in loss of strength, tone, and reflexes with the denervated muscle showing wasting and denervation hypersensitivity in the form of fasciculations. Important points to remember, number one, the upper motor neuron syndrome is a combination of loss of the direct cortical spinal tract effect on lower motor neuron and the loss of regulation of the indirect brainstem motor control centers. Patient is in the decorticate position with the upper extremities in flexion, the lower extremities in extension, um, reflecting that the brainstem motor centers are working, but we don't have modulation of those centers from the cortical spinal tracts and their connections to the brainstem centers. If we now go a step lower as far as the level of dysfunction and eliminate the function of the rubrospinals, we go from decorticate to decerebrate posturing. The lower extremities stay in extension, now the upper extremities are in extension because we don't have a, any type of regulation or modulation of the vestibulospinal or the reticulospinal tracts, but we've eliminated the influence of the rubrospinal tracts at this point in time. If there's to be further progression and the patient has further deterioration and we now eliminate the function of the vestibulospinal and the reticulospinal tracts, the patient would then become flaccid. and dead. <laughs> Number three, an upper motor neuron lesion is on the opposite side of the clinical findings for a lesion above the decussation of the pyramids, whereas it is on the same side as clinical findings if the lesion is in the spinal cord. Number four, spinal cord lesions often give upper motor neuron signs below the level of the lesion from effect on the cortical spinal tract and lower motor neuron signs at the level of the lesion.
from effect on the ventral horn or the ventral nerve root. Number five, lower motor neuron signs are good for locating the level of a spinal cord lesion. Clinical testing for the motor system includes muscle strength, tone, reflexes, and pathological reflexes. An important part of the motor examination is the assessment of tone. And when we think of hypertonicity, increased tone, there's two main divisions, one of spasticity and the other of rigidity. Spasticity, which usually reflects cortical spinal tract disease, is rate and force dependent, and at the very end of the range of motion, there's a giveaway. This has been referred to as the clasp knife phenomenon. It gets its name from the action of closing a pocket knife blade. As we initially put force on the pocket knife blade and try to close it, we have to put a lot of force, there's a lot of resistance. Right up until towards the end of the closing, where it just gives away and closes. That's the same type of giveaway phenomenon that we see in spasticity. Now this is opposed to rigidity. Rigidity is usually secondary or from basal ganglia disease. The rigidity is not rate or force dependent. It's constant throughout the range of motion. So it's oftentimes referred to as lead pipe or in modern terms, a plastic-like rigidity. It's kind of like this piece of plastic when I bend it back and forth. I have the same amount of resistance throughout the range of motion, and it's not really uh, force or rate dependent. That's what rigidity feels like, is that plastic-like resistance throughout the range of motion. Pearls. Acute upper motor neuron lesions and upper motor neuron lesions in infants can produce hypotonia initially with hypertonia occurring later.